Is there any movie about bees that isn't memorable? You have The Wicker Man, you have My Girl, no, well, maybe the bee movie. But most importantly, you have 1992's Candyman. You are not content with the stories, so I was obliged to come. Welcome to Cryptic Cocktails, where we break down the mysterious and the macabre in popular culture. Now, Candyman came out when I was in junior high, and immediately I was hooked. Sorry for the bad pun. It had everything. It had Tony Todd, young Virginia Madsen. It had that whole Bloody Mary angle to it. And Candyman still holds up today. But today I want to talk about the short story that actually formed the basis for the movie Candyman. It's Clive Barker's The Forbidden, which is on his series Books of Blood. But before we even talk about the story The Forbidden, we should probably talk about the short film Clive Barker made with some of his friends back in the late 70s called The Forbidden. It was a short film did feature a young Doug Bradley, who would later go on to become Pinhead. You know, there's, there's a lot of gratuitous uh, male genitalia, I'll just put it that way. It has about five minutes of what Joe Bob Briggs might call penis foo. I was somewhat surprised, I'm not sure why, but somewhat surprised to see how uh, closely the story of the Forbidden and the movie Candyman actually do follow each other. Helen in the movie studies folklore, but Helen in the short story is actually studying graffiti. So she goes to Spectre Street, which is a housing project, um, we're assuming in the UK, and it's similar to the housing project shown in the movie Candyman, except it's a little bit more Lovecraftian. There's more of a kind of a creeping horror vibe, like you don't really know what's coming next, as opposed to the very real material in-your-face danger that you find in the movie The Candyman. Helen explores the area alone, and just like in the movie, she has a hard time getting the locals to accept her. She does end up meeting, again, a single mother, just like in the movie, takes her in and initiates her, if you will, into the actual community that's going on at Spectre Street. I think we should probably say spoiler time. In the book, as well as in the movie, uh, Helen finds a sort of ghoulish temple to the Candyman. There's a giant face and you crawl through the mouth and the eyes are rolled back in the head. And while Helen in the movie Candyman summons Candyman through a mirror, Helen in the book actually summons him through her just sheer disbelief in the, in the idea of the Candyman. In the movie and in The Forbidden, the Candyman announces that he is a rumor, that he is neither real nor imaginary. He lives in between worlds, and he says it's a wonderful existence. One could find parallels to Candyman's existence in the concept of a tulpa, which for Western audiences is, is sort of its own thing. It's not quite what Tibetans mean by a tulpa, but basically an idea brought to life or a, a, an artificial creation that's summoned through uh, psychic powers or magical powers, sort of like the tulpas in Twin Peaks. You could also consider it perhaps an egregore, which is a sort of a magical power or, or elevated spiritual energy that uh, a community gets when they're all thinking the same thing together. This rumor needs to be spread in order for the candy man to have power. And at one point, the mother of the baby Carrie in the, in the book The Forbidden says to Helen, you've got to tell somebody, haven't you? You know, and she's making up at least outlandish stories about Egyptian ants and, and just crazy murders going on in Spectre Street. And just like in the movie, Helen's shown around by a young boy. This young boy is not quite as much of a, of a factor as he is in the movie, The Candyman. But he takes her around and she meets some older women that live in the complex. And they're uh, sharing stories with her as well. And they keep getting more lurid and more unbelievable. But Helen's taking it hook, line, and sinker. Sorry about that. Breaking away from Spectre Street for a moment, Helen actually meets up with Trevor and Purcell and Bernadette, and Trevor and Purcell uh, question Helen and say, how do you know they're not lying to you? And Helen, perhaps in her, uh, you know, sort of ivory tower mindset, doesn't believe that these very simple, quote-unquote, people could be lying to her. Helen keeps finding a void in her life that's filled by her going back to Spectre Street, even though more and more unsettling things start to occur. Now, Candyman in the movie has a subplot where he was a wealthy black man who was tortured to death by bees. Uh, this isn't in The Forbidden. The Forbidden doesn't deal with topics of race. It's more of a classic horror story. And when Helen explores even more, she finds the baby, and unlike in the movie, the baby is actually dead. When Candyman does appear, he's very waxy. He's described as being very waxy. And he goes in for a kiss with Helen, and he says, uh, I won't, un you know, let me unhook you, but I won't do it unless you want me to. But he wants to unhook her from reality. So by unhooking her, she can become like his existence, and she can live between the worlds as well. His jacket opens up, and all of a sudden is revealed that he is sort of rotten inside, and what's left of him is covered in bees, and the bees are swarming out of him, and he's, he's sort of a living, walking, talking beehive. 
And of course, something very obvious that I didn't notice until my fifth time watching this movie is the hook is clearly the bee's stinger. But why bees? I think that in some ways the bees sort of signify the community of Spectre Street. There's a sort of a buzz in between them and, and the buzzing between the residents. That's where Candyman lives. He lives in the buzzing. He doesn't live in the hive. And bees have a lot of occult symbolism uh, over the years. I won't get into all of it, but one that I think is particularly interesting, both for the movie and for the short story The Forbidden, is found in the Book of Judges. Samson sets up a marriage to a Philistine girl, and on his way traveling there uh, with his parents, he rips a lion in half, just tears it asunder, you know, and he leaves it there. And then he comes back a little bit later to find the carcass, and the carcass is full of bees. And they're making honey in there, and he rips the honeycombs out of the lion, and then he gives it to his parents, and he eats it on the way uh, to, to where the wedding is. Then he later makes a riddle out of it, out of the eater, something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet. And I won't get into the whole rest of the biblical story, lots of revenge, lots of killing, yada, yada, yada. But this concept of something terrifying, like the candy man or a lion, being rotten inside and full of bees, uh, you can't tell me Clive Barker didn't pick that up from there. That's it. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious. There's also Psalm 118. They swarmed around me like bees. They were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. I don't think that has anything to do with the story, but it's a nice segue into the bonfire, which ends up being the pivotal ending scene for both the movie and the short story The Forbidden. Both in the short story and in the movie, the young boy mentions that a bonfire is going to be happening soon. It's very much a Chekhov's gun thing. It's mentioned early on, and you wonder how this is going to pay off at the end. In Candyman, the true villain of the movie is poverty and social injustice and racism, um, and Helen gets to sort of redeem herself for all of these actions that she's doing without remembering it or under the Candyman's influence. It's really kind of up to the up to the viewer to to determine what is what Helen is up to. In the book, Helen chases what she knows is a corpse of a baby because she realizes that the entire community is in on something, and she wants to prove to somebody, I guess, outside of Spectre Street that something nefarious is going on. So she tracks the baby into the bonfire, and when she goes in there, so the baby's already dead. There's no redemption, and she finds the Candyman in there. And as she's dying, she sees Trevor coming frantically looking for her. So I guess he gets a bit of a redemptive arc in the story that he doesn't get in the movie. If you haven't read The Forbidden, even though I've sort of spoiled it for you, I'd still recommend it. It's only about 20, 30 pages. It's a short read. And if you're into Clive Barker, write some excellent horror fiction, why not? One thing that nobody seems to mention when they're talking about this movie, and it's never brought up in the movie or in the short story, Sweets to the Sweet. I mean, it's everywhere in this movie, and it's everywhere in the book, and nobody ever discusses where this comes from. But it actually comes from uh, Hamlet. Uh, from Ophelia's funeral, where the queen is throwing flowers and bouquets of flowers after Ophelia going into the grave, saying, sweets to the sweets, sweets to the sweets. So, like Helen, who's driven to madness, so is Ophelia. And as we all know, who likes flowers better than bees? If you like that, make sure to like and subscribe, and uh, I'll get you more of this content. I'm planning on doing the next video on the new Candyman remake, so uh, stay tuned.